Waigiri Ji Ka Khalsa, Waigiri Ji Ki Fateh. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to EY. My name is Indy Hoti, and I'm the co-lead of the EY Seek Network here. For those of you who aren't aware, EY is one of the largest professional services firms in the world, operating in over 150 countries, providing assurance, tax, consulting, and transaction advisory services to corporate and government clients. We at the EY Seek Network are extremely proud to be hosting a punt time discussion show at our offices in London Bridge after the hugely successful live broadcast in 2014. Now, the EY Seek Network is part of EY's wider diversity and inclusiveness initiatives. Leading in diversity and inclusiveness is one of the firm's main objectives. Now, embedding a sustainable and inclusive culture in the way we operate enables our people to achieve their potential and make a difference wherever they come from and whatever their characteristics. A sustainable, inclusive culture better enables EY to deliver high quality service to our clients, create a competitive advantage and drive market leadership. Now, many organisations have different ways of defining diversity and inclusiveness and many different names for it. Our definition is diversity. That is the mix of our people, including differences in gender, ethnicity, national cultures, subcultures, sexual, sexual orientation, disability and generation. The mix varies amongst our, varies amongst our geographical areas and sub-areas. Now, inclusiveness is how we make that mix work. It's absolutely key. It's, it's about creating an environment where all people feel valued, are part of the community, and are able to perform at their best and achieve their potential. Now, the EY Seek Network has been operating for just over four years, of which the last two years have been open to the public. The aim of the network has been to support EY's diversity and inclusiveness initiatives to, through helping educate the firm, its employees, and to raise awareness of the Sikh community. The network currently focuses on three different themes. Number one is education, number two is the arts, and also student support. Now, the network has hosted a range of events previously, such as the educational 10-part Waiguru course by Jagraj Singh at base of Sikhi, the Singh Project Art Exhibition, all the way to events such as the Turbanology event, which looked to explore the history of British Sikhs, which was presented by Vince Cable, the Secretary of State for Business. And more recently, we hosted the Visaki celebrations at City Hall in conjunction with the Mayor of London, which had a key focus on Kirtan and Langar. Now, with regards to the Bunt Time program this evening, EY also has a very strong commitment to women's advancement in leadership and gender equality across the firm. Now, EY recognises that women are the largest emerging market in the world. It's predicted over the next decade they will wield enormous influence over politics, sport, business and society. In the next five years, the global incomes of women will grow from 13 trillion US dollars to 18 trillion. Now, that incremental 5 trillion is almost twice the growth of GDP expected in China and India combined. By year 2028, women will control close to 75% of discretionary spending worldwide. Now, EY demonstrates its commitment to gender equality through a number of different programs. We have fast-track leadership programs, sponsorship to accelerate women's progress in the workplace, flexible working practices to support families and working mothers, ex excellent maternity leave support and support to re-enter the working environment, and finally, the EY Women's Network is one of the largest networks here at EY, providing support to all of its employees. Now, we at the EYC Network are delighted to be supporting EY's wider initiatives by hosting the Punt Time program. We'll be exploring Sikh women in roles across leadership and how Sikhi inspires those multiple roles that women play in society. We have a fantastic and diverse range of, of panelists um, leading in their respective fields, which includes education, professional services, the charity sector, and arts. Now, we hope this program is educational, insightful, and if any of you would like to find out more about EY's diversity and inclusiveness initiatives, then please contact us on eycgroup at uk.ey.com. I'd like now to hand over to the host for our program today, Dr. Savi Singh Arora. Well, hi, welcome to Bunt Time. And uh, I'll do my David Dibble wee bit. I'm going to hear the music in the background. But more importantly, I wanted to just pick up on uh, one of the statistics that uh, I found recently 
posted actually in the Daily Telegraph and various places this week actually. It was interesting in the fact that there's a greater share of women between the ages of 25 and 29 that have now got a bachelor's degree and the gap continues to widen. Although I would also say, statistically, if you look at Pew Research, they suggest that only 5% of CEOs in the world are actually women. Okay, so hence the reason for picking the two questions that we're going to be concentrating on this evening. So the format for this evening, let me just introduce to you first of all the questions, and then I'm going to introduce the names, then without seeing their thunder, they can talk about their own personal experiences. And then we'll come back to answering the question, and then we'll open it up to the audience. So if you've got any feedback, or you widely disagree with something that's been said, or you've got your, one of your own experiences that you want to share with us, I think it'd be a great opportunity for us to all learn together. So, what are the two questions that we're dealing with today? Well, the first one really is about Sikh women in the role of leadership. And if you know about your Sikh history, and again, I won't steal the thunder of some of the experiences that we'll talk about, uh, but there is some great Sikh women in history who have led the way and have been absolutely courageous. And at this time, when we're looking at Vasaki, you know, it's a wonderful time to celebrate uh, the religious aspect of Vasaki. It has cultural aspects as well, but for today, we're talking about uh, the fact that we've got Sikh women in roles of leadership. That's the first area. The second area that we want to look at, and again, it's, it's kind of closely related. Um, Anish sat on the panel here, and she works for EY. She's been instrumental in helping to organise this particular conference, and we've had lots of chats over the phone. And, like, what should we focus on? And it's interesting, again and again, the theme that comes out, which is the second area, is to talk about the role of women and how the role of the women actually changes. Now, putting aside some of the traditional stereotypical roles that women end up being. Now, let's not kind of, you know, beat about the bush here. Some people adopt a traditional style. It depends on the family, right? But then, interestingly, you know, you could be a sister, a mother, you know, you go on. If you choose to be a mother going forward, you would be uh, in a position of influence one of the things I thought about was, what about the spiritual aspect? Are women leading that in the family? But again, it, it depends on the dynamics of that household. Maybe the, you know, the man of the household is spiritual and he, he is nurturing children and it kind of you know, emulates and perpetuates through the entire family. So I think it's interesting, the second question that really focuses on the multiple roles of women uh, and how that's changing and how it's changed over time as well. And if that's an important thing to think about. It's not about evolution, as many people talk about. It's also about revolution. Because Sikhi was really revolutionary in the context of Guru Nanak saying that men and women are the same. Right? And that's, that's incredible when you think about that. So I'm going to just quickly introduce the names of the people around the panel. I'm going to start from my right, which is your left. Is that right? Is that how it works? OK. We've got Sukhmani Kaur. Very quickly, fantastic author, also works with Jagraj as well, but again, I won't steal her thunder, she's going to come back and tell us more. Got Bao Kay, who recently won Inspirational Woman of the Year. You might have recognised her, she'd spent a lot of time on TV, actually saying, we need to do something about the Somerset floods, which is fantastic. Good press coverage as well for Casa Aid there. Anisha Set works at EY, and uh, she's really up and coming. That's what she said to me anyway. So <laughs> My bank account uh, sort code ID <laughs> is still open for you. Right. I'll sort it out tomorrow. Thank you very much. <laughs> I thought that bank transfer went through last night. <laughs> <laughs> I've given you credit for no reason. Okay. Also, Pranjit Kaur works for JP Morgan, right, and she'll tell us a little bit more. And she has been on Bunk Time before. Great to have you back. Thanks very much. And the Sing Twins. It's the first time I've met you. I forgot that you lived in Liverpool. <laughs> but someone's got to. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, it's a, is that is that a city of culture, right? And culturally, uh, how wonderful uh, a representation again from different walks of life here: artists, uh, you know, financial people, charity workers, you know, people that work in health, and somebody who works in EY and does a great job, yeah. right? Um, so you know, all the pressures there now. You see, yeah. all, the, all the great things you do in EY. Okay, so you might have recognised some of the paintings that um, Sing Twins have done. Uh, I thought the very profound one was the Golden Temple one which has a lot of stories. When you look in detail at that painting, it's absolutely incredible. So this is our panellists, and uh, please give them a round of applause and thank them very much for their time today.
without further ado, Sukhmani, tell us a little bit about your background, why you're here, what do you think you can achieve from uh, this discussion today? Uh, my name is Sukhmani Kaur. Uh, thanks for, uh, to EY Network for inviting me to be a part of the panel. So um, I'm the part of um, Everything's 13, which is a Sikh educational charity uh, based in West London. And it's mostly known for uh, the project which we run um, YouTube channel, Basics of Sikhi. Um, my husband um, runs it, Jigar Singh. Um, I do children's projects for the charity. One of them is a Mighty Khalsa, which is um, books and media for children. And we've published uh, two books. We're preparing a third one, which is going to be Sikh Nursery Rhymes. And um, other project which I run is um, Kiddi Sangat. Kiddi Sangat is a play group for under fives, Sikh play group for under children under five years old. And uh, we've started about three years ago. It runs in South Hall. And now we have one running in Karamsa, uh, which is um, Ilford area. And then now third one is starting in Woolwich. So it's a, sort of like a little franchise. Um, and my background is um, in education. I worked in uh, Guru Nanak Sikh school for about six, seven years. I was teaching Punjabi and Sikh studies. And um, so now I work in the charity, um, charity sector. Thank you. Okay. Oh, okay. Why good to for um, I work in the NHS. I'm a diabetes specialist. Um, I've been doing that for some 17 years. I'm general secretary of Khalsa Aid, I'm sure you all know, and I'm also Rivi's wife. And um, I chair the Community Safety Committee of the Seat Council UK. So that's about it. And I won an award. And you won an award. <laughs> okay. Vaigurji ka khalsa, Vaigurji fateh. Welcome everybody and thank you for coming to uh, the EY Seat Network once time women's special. I'd just take, like to take a moment and uh, on our Vasaki special I'd just like to, uh, for us all to remember Martha Saib Gaur. Uh, who was the mother of Khalsa today. Um, I'm Anish Seth and I, I think as uh, Dr. Savi's uh, introduced me, I work at here at EY, I work in tax. I've been here for about 18 months or so. Um, I also co-lead the EY Seek Network and I think that that's one of my achievements and probably another reason I'm sitting on the panel, to be honest, because I have organised this event. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, basically, um, I'm actually the first female lead that EYC Network has had after three males. So I think that that's a bit like quite an achievement and uh, shows EY's commitment to DNI as Indy mentioned previously. But another reason is um, <laughs> without uh, being offensive to the other panelists, I, I'm one of the youngest here. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> so um, with all due respect, um, so I think that with, I'm not saying that I'm going to speak for all the youth out there, but I think it's quite important to uh, have a youth perspective in these discussions. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. So we are going to come back in a minute. So we're going to go for the question, but we'll finish off the introductions. Tell us all about your exciting work at JP Morgan. Why, why are you here? Well, Arisha said uh, the magic words there. She's the youngest, I'm the oldest. <laughs> Somebody's got to sure balance that. Balance that. <laughs> um, so I, my name is Paramjit Kormatharu, and I work at JP Morgan. I've been there about 18 years. Uh, I'm a managing director there and uh, global head of uh, indirect taxes. Um, I've also been at the um, Sikh Council UK for about three years now, and I head up the subcommittee that deals with European and international affairs. Uh, I also work with SICRI on educational programs and have been involved in doing items such as discussions around Sarbath Khalsa and the Sikh profile, both from a spiritual and political uh, perspective. The main reason I came today, because I feel I'm already a little bit overexposed in month time, but today was about women and I thought that was, uh, it's worth coming. I'm the youngest of five daughters with one brother, uh, that's a perspective I wanted to share, and I have three grown-up sons. So um, I thought we might have a good discussion. Fantastic. Thank you so much for coming. I know you've got a very busy schedule. Let's just thank everybody else as well. Yeah. Sing Twins, tell us a little bit about yourselves, um, a little bit about your background. Vaigji Kakalsa, Vaigji Kifate. We're the Sing Twins. We're here representing the twins on the panel. <laughs> um, also British artists. Um, really, we're here to represent the arts, I guess. Uh, it's, it, we feel it's been an area um, within our community It's very often up underrepresented and we're delighted to be able to put forward our perspective of the different types of leadership that we can bring perhaps to the table 
as visual artists. Mm -hmm. We're one of the few uh, Sikh women artists, I think, that have made a, a niche for ourselves within a contemporary mainstream platform. And we've done that through an art form which challenges negative stereotypes and also cultural prejudice within the art world itself. Um, we work in a very traditional Indian style, for those of you who are not familiar with our work, and we're really trying to uh, get value for that within mainstream contemporary art. We came, coming from a background where there was a lot of prejudice to the type of work that we were doing, and really by pursuing the work that we do, we're challenging the, the perception that West is best, um, and really trying to make a difference through introducing a new genre of art to British contemporary art itself. Okay, well, thank you for that. So now we're going to go for the question now, uh, which is, again, about um, leadership, uh, women uh, in leadership, leadership roles, Sikh women in particular. I mean, there's a number of ways that we can paraphrase that question. Firstly, we can talk about the fact that what are the typical traits that a leader shows? Now, having done some competency work myself, if you look typically, you look at inclusiveness, you look at special relationship, you look at the traits of actually being a good orator, you know, if you look at, say, for example, would you say that Obama is a good leader? He's able to communicate pretty well, but is that enough? Or does he have a great team behind him of all mixed abilities that can come together? And being a leader, does that necessarily mean that you are brilliant at what you do and everyone else follows you, or are you able to bring the best out of it, those individuals or those teams, whether it be in your particular industry sector? So I'm going to go back to the panel. They're going to give us their views on leadership and women in particular. So I would say, you know, just to start you off, Sukhmani, I would say that you're a leader in your field because, you know, you've got that educational background, you've got the pegiology, so you know about the quality of learning, and you've taken a kind of a, you know, a way forward that says, look, I'm going to produce these books and they're going to be of high quality. Do you, what are the values of leadership that you feel are important, uh, especially from the Sikh women perspective? Um, I think... Um well, basically, my position is that if I see that something needs to be done and nobody's st stood up to do it, and I see that I, I have the qualifications and I have abilities to produce it, then I'll, I'll, I'll make it happen. And so far, we've been very blessed because uh, we started from nothing. I, I wanted to do books and I was waiting for opportunity. I was waiting, waiting and waiting, waiting, and there's, why do I wait? Just make it happen, start doing it, and. Um, the response was really positive. Uh, same with the playgroup. When you see that there is so many other things for children, but there's nothing for sick uh, related, so um, you just you just take this step forward and you make it happen. Do you think there's any aspect of you know the the, the female aspect that gives you that drive, or do you think there's? Um, I, I'll give you an example. Uh, we, we were talking about this the other day. If you look at the granddaughter of uh, Ranjit Singh. Uh, the daughter of Dilip Singh, uh, Princess Sophia. Now, do you know, it's not widely known, that Princess Sophia worked with Emily Pankhurst at, during the turn of the century, last century, to lead the equality uh, framework so that women could get equal rights as well as votes. Now, was that the Sikh blood that was driving that, that kind of, you know, real kind of urge and drive to do something? Do you think that's the case? I can't, I can't speak for her, I can speak for myself. <laughs> I know what drives me. I mean, my children drive me, so if I want something for them and I want them to have more inspiration towards Sikhi, um, and maybe through the games, through the books, through the apps, through the songs, I'll make it happen for them. Brilliant. So and that other children can benefit as well. Fantastic. And then, Bao okay, tell us, again, from that context, you know. Um, I think definitely Sikh women are more assertive and more persuasive, definitely. Um, and interestingly, I, I was looking earlier today, there's been a study done um, by a Princeton-based management consultancy firm, and they found that women that are at the top of the game, that are leaders, are women that have that can-do, will-do attitude. And I think Sikh girls grow up with a lot of that anyway, because culturally we face a lot of barriers. Mm -hmm. Although Sikhi tells us that women and men are equal, culturally, if we look into our communities, we are told that we can't do that that's not really for you so we have that attitude to get to where we are anyway so it goes hand in hand to be leaders you have to have that assertive attitude yes and i mean just coming on from what bal said i completely agree i think you know it is in our blood and 
it's always that culture religion clash that a lot of us face but when coming back to leadership like we i mean all of us are in different fields and we all have different careers so we face leadership in well two aspects of Sikh women really one in the wider community so in our careers um and then the second one is within the Sikh community, within you know our own like organisations and uh, you know our Gurdwara committees and the wider you know Sikh charities or whatever, but our own community itself. So I think that with regards to like even EY here, I mean we did a we looked at the statistics actually of uh, Ju um, year end June 14, and in the leadership team there is not one Sikh woman. Not one. Now, is that because, you know, I mean, things that we should explore, is, is that because we are facing barriers? You know, there is such th as a thing as, you know, the glass ceiling and such. But in my experience, I wouldn't necessarily say so at my level because, you know, I, I, I would say at my level, definitely in my career, it, you know, it's colour blind and gender blind. But then, you know, is there, is there a struggle within, you know, careers, progression? Um, in the wider community, but then also, what I have found is, you know, leading um, the Sikh network here, you know, in the Sikh community, there it, there are barriers as well. Like I've turned up to events where I'm pretty much the only girl there, you know, and then uh, all the men are going, oh, where where are all the women, you know, and uh, five foot two, I'm standing there, oh, I'm here, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> But um, I think that that's something that I think that there is a problem. But at the same time, I think that what we or what I am seeing um, is again from that sort of youth aspect. There are young women all coming forward as well. There are a lot of women coming forward, and they're using other kind of mediums such as social media and things like that. So I think there is a change of a there is the, like a change in the trend. But maybe the progression of it is a lot slower than maybe uh, we would like. Okay, well, thank you for that, Project. And you've got a lot of experience in. Um Seeing, you know, we were talking about time. Are things changing over time, especially in your in your field? I mean, you've got a very senior position that you're in right now. Yes, I, I think there is actually. Uh, I, I feel very hopeful that if you look around, both within our own Sikh community and if you look at society generally, the biggest change has been education. And I think if you look around, the, I'm, I'm really pleased. If you look at the the audience today, this is probably one of the biggest female audiences we've had. If you look at the balance, which is a really nice thing to see. Um, but, but speaking more to the, to, to the topic that you have raised, I think um, in my lifetime, uh, I know that when I was at, uh, wanted to read A-levels, uh, in my secondary school, I went to an all-girls school, which was kind of the traditional thing that was done. I was born and brought up in Kenya. Uh, when I wanted to read my A-levels, uh, I was a bit stubborn, and I told my dad I wanted to go to a school which was renowned for its uh, educational qualifications. It happened to be a boys' school that opened up just for the two upper years. Um, so you had sort of 2,000 boys and 10 girls. I was one of the 10. Um, but I think leadership to me is, is about, um, I think if you, if you think of it from a Sikhi perspective, we are gender agnostic, or should be. Uh, and then the other instruction we have is obviously get the kidney, live in the moment, jagruti, have self-awareness, awakeness, be conscious in what you're doing. And I think so if you apply that principle to wherever you are in life, whether you're raising children, whether you're making sabji in the kitchen, whether you're running a tax department, or whether you're reading politics, if you're in that moment being the best you can be, what you end up having is a vision. So if you have a vision and you have a goal and you do the best you can, those, those attributes you know, bring out the best in you and that creates a leadership. But I think the biggest thing for me is leadership is not about competitiveness, I think. From a, from a Sikhi perspective particularly, you're leading because you want to achieve. And I think like uh, Sikhmani Kaur said, for, for me personally, um, some of the biggest kind of hurdles that I've run across has, have been partly because I want to do it for my children and I, then I want them to know it can be done. And, uh, you know, so it, it, I think that is a big motivation. Fantastic. Thank you very much for that. Sing Twins, you, what would you like to tell us about in terms of from a Sikhi leadership perspective? And I said, I mean, obviously, some of the work that you've done, the pieces that you've done, and I referred earlier on to the the Golden Temple picture that you did, which had a lot of you know intricate detail, but also had stories within it. If you, I mean, if you look at it long enough, there's a lot of um, 
uh, contextual aspect that you can bring out. I mean, it's a narrative in its own right. Every element of it is. Do you think you're, uh, there's an element of uh, kind of the traits of Sikhi that are driving you forward as a Sikh, as Sikh women? Yes, definitely. I think um, from our own background of uh, going through an art system where we were expected to conform to Western ways of looking at art for a start um, and having a, a self-belief in ourselves, I think that comes from very, you know, it's something very uh, thick about that, having self-belief and um, not really conforming to what other people want you to be but demanding acceptance on your own terms and I think that's what drove our art in the first place. I don't think we would be artists without that experience and without that, um, that belief that we can actually make a difference through the work that we do. We use our work as a power of, um, sorry, a tool of communication and you know, whether it's talking about 1984 issues or other political issues, I think um, you know, telling our own narrative through our work, having a voice, I think uh, all those are tools that you need in terms of um, really trying to make a difference and, and lead the way in whatever field you're in. Mm, I think I'd add to that also having a self-pride in who you are mm. um, as well and wanting to share that with other people. Um, really, a lot of the backlash that we received was because we were working from a very traditional perspective, but what also growing by, up... What do you mean by backlash? Well, we went through an art system which my sister mentioned was very Eurocentric in its perspective. We were working in a tradition of art that goes back to uh, an ancient style in India, and we were told and with no uncertain terms that that was a backward, outdated tradition that had no place in contemporary art. And for us, that was an insult, not just as our sort of own self as artists, but our, our community and our heritage too. And I think that was a real driving force. Because we had developed such a pride in our own identity in any case, as young teenagers, we'd travelled to India and spent 12 months around there exploring our heritage. And we came back with a very determined idea of who we were. And um, I think at that stage, we were not prepared to listen to anybody else that you know, our heritage was any less than, than European heritage, for example. That's very much been a driving force um, through our work, mm. but also it's this idea that as an artist you have a, a social political conscience, and I think that also comes very much from our Sikh upbringing and the idea of you know the midi pity, if you like, having uh, religious responsibilities but also uh, uh, secular responsibilities in life and using our language as artists to challenge the, the injustices that we see, like through the paintings of 1984, for example, which is more about the human tragedy of that event and trying to put in context why it was that felt, uh, Sikhs felt so aggrieved by what had happened, rather than the pure politics of, of that, which you know, was sort of Very being complex. distorted through mm -hmm. propaganda and all sorts of other media misrepresentation. There's a lot of... Um, uh, <coughs> there seems to be... Um, and we don't concentrate on this too much, but on the 1984 aspect, there was a lot of stories about families. You know, and, and I think, you know, obviously, by you bringing that out, you, you, as women, do you think... Do you identify with that more? Well, I don't think we're any more... Um, sort of emotionally attached to the idea of suffering in the world because we're women and that's where that painting is coming from. I think that's something that's shared by many people, you know, the, the decent heart and a sort of a conscience to see what's going and on empathy, in the world. Yeah. yeah, I don't think that's something that's unique to women. I think it's a lot we share with men that, you know, we have to, to shout about and applaud as well. Okay, well, thank you so much for your kind of bringing out the kind of main themes. Some of the things that I, 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 w I was looking at were we're talking, we're talking about drive, we're talking about if you want to do something, uh, you get on and do it. Uh, we look at opportunities as well, that's some of the points that have actually been raised. I wanted to open now up to the audience specifically around this. If you've got any feedback, any specific uh, examples of your own where you feel that you know, we see the emergence of women, uh, Sikh women in particular, in the leadership positions. So let's, uh, who's the first person that's going to volunteer to, uh, to say something? Well, the lady at the front here, sorry. I think it would be great if you could just stand up and... Vaheguru Ji Ka Khalsa, Vaheguru Ji Ki Fateh. Is it possible to make a little comment before I ask my question? Absolutely, yeah. Um, my very big and sincere thanks. I do not know all the youngsters to Indy, whom I know, to uh, organizing this event for women. So that's very important. Women is very close to my heart and uh, I have always struggled or fought for women's issues. So thank you very much, all the team. Well done. Keep the good work up. Uh, the question I have is, the education has been mentioned twice. And it's very important for women to get educated. I mean, it's a good saying that um, if you educate a woman, you can educate the world. My question is, when I was young, not many years ago, but um, uh, when I was working, it was a struggle for us. 
to get to the point where we wanted to get. And um, being Asian woman, there was too much pressure from outside and of course from internal and the community. My question to the panel is, is the pressure elevated a little bit? And is the comparison better than what it was before? Do you think, you did mention actually in your opening remarks to say it is better but it will take long time to reach. How can it be made possible uh, for youngsters, A, to get into politics, B, to get into executive positions. Because that really worries me. The leadership is important. It's very important when you work all your life, study all your life, but there are some drawbacks or some restrictions and barriers. How do you think we can all get together? Good experience from young people, good, ex good experience from not so young people, so that our youngsters can move forward, particularly Sikhs. I'm very interested in Okay, I think we Thank put that question to uh, Pranjit first, and then uh, Anisha, I think you might want to come in on this too, yeah? Thank you very much. And I think, I think that is a, a really good set of questions there. I, I'm like you. I've, I've come through a school of uh, struggle. And I think your two, two questions, you know, how do we get our kids into executive positions, and how do we actually get them more engaged in politics? I think the, the first thing is that within our own uh, community within our culture, that empowerment of children, it comes from within the home first. So I think the environment within the home and how the parents are treating both boys and girls in an equal way, equal education, but also when, when the kids then get married and, and you bring daughters-in-law and sons-in-law into the equation, because early careers are formed around the same time that children are getting married and having their own children. So I think that ethos of both sides of your life are important, the work-life balance. It comes from having that holistic understanding within the family. I, I, for myself, know that when I first got married, all I really wanted to do was have a family. I'd kind of, that, that was quite a, a keen, um, I, I hadn't really thought I would have a big career. Um, the, the, there was quite a, quite a gap. I had, I had my children several years after. I got married, and during that time, it was like, okay, so what am I doing with, with my life? I've got an education, I'm going to work. Uh, I have to say that it, it was really my husband's support that made me feel empowered enough to go out and, and work. Then it comes back to doing the best you can in the moment, live in the moment. So, I, I mean, what I would say to the kids of today is it's no different today than it was before. Success the first key ingredient to success, whether you want to go into politics or into any executive position, is hard work. You can't get away from that. Hard work, and of course, luck plays a role. You have to be in the right place at the right time. But the key ingredient as a community, as a society, as a broader comment for, for society at large, I think the framework in which you know, people are supported, you get the right mentors, you get you know, your, your family, your parents, siblings, understand, that balance of, I can spend the time today at work, tomorrow I'll do the, the shift at home. Uh, for me, the fact that I did have a career that was budding, but at the same time, the children that I really, really wanted and loved uh, came into my life. And then it was a question of, you know, three kids and a mortgage plus a career. How are you going to balance that? Only through clear communication. And the discussion at home, how are we going to balance this? So for me, this, the secret of whether you want to go into politics or you want to go into social care or you want to be a medic, it, it really does come down to communication with your family, with your people who are close to you, um, and then within your work environment to, to actually have a clear vision. I think to achieve things in life, you have to be awake, alert to opportunities. You have to work hard. And then I think you set your goals. Because without a goal, you can sometimes go awry. So I think that, that's how I, I think we can progress. And so education is a big part of that. But education has to be used in the right way. So we, we have to be clear about what our targets are. With an attempt to be contentious here, what about the fact that opportunity is Then I, I want to bring an issue in here. So you get an opportunity. Because I, mean, yeah. I think it's all very well trying to balance and, you know, working with your husband or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, I, just coming back to your question, which was about, you know, are things different now to the way they were before? Because everyone's got a struggle. And why, do, I think women struggling more than others uh, because there is no opportunity there. Or the fact that opportunity is being offered, uh, but it's just the kind of the framework that, that women may find themselves in where they have to spend more time at home if they decide to do that, you know? Because although paternity leave is offered to both, 
Um, what I've noticed in my career is that sometimes people spend, spend time at home, they happens to be the woman, and when they come back to work, other people have moved on. So they may not have had the same opportunity. There doesn't seem to be any outreach from the organisation to say, here's something to keep you in touch. But I would say, now that we can work from home, some of us, when we do work from home, they do have an opportunity to maybe stay in touch and they don't have to be in the office. Let, let me bring an issue in here quickly. So is there an opportunity is the question, right? There are. I think there are if we want them to be. But there's loads of sort of background factors. So, you know, there might be the same amount of jobs or the same amount of roles and everything like that. Um, and the opportunities are there. But, I mean, from like, kind of like from someone, you know, who's a bit younger, just, I've just pretty much very early on in my career, you know, the same amount of grad schemes, the same amount of jobs were out there. Um, I had, you know, the same education as, you know, I was in a class full of, I think it was about 50% boys, 50% girls at that time. So I think the opportunities are there, but I think it all comes from, and leading on from Brumduke's point, it's all about family support. So I think it's all about the parents, because I mean I'm not I'm not married yet or anything, so I can't speak about you know the afterwards. But right now I know that the biggest drive from education um, and even to this point where I'm sitting at EY was my parents. You know, had they sort of differentiated or told me that there's not enough opportunities for me, then you know my life's decisions would have probably have uh, differed quite a lot from what they are now. But you know, my mum and dad they pushed me. They said, you know, they saw my potential and um, they said, you know, you can do that. So I got, you know, I was quite good at school, so I worked hard and I knew that I could achieve whatever I set out to achieve. However, at the same time, you know, I still come to that sort of, I'm well aware, as, as sort of moderately progressive as my parents are and as supportive as, you know, even my mum is of everything that I do. And, um, you know, she still told me that, okay, wait, but when you get married, you know, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, like, I, I took a gap year and she taught me how to cook, you know, <laughs> and, um, you know, so, you know, and she goes, like, you need to know how to clean and, you know, when you have kids, things will change. So I think, I don't think it's about the lack of opportunities. I think it's also about the choices that we make. And I think as women, you know, we're naturally going to be the mothers, aren't we? So at that time, you know, I think that that's the choice that certain women do make. Like, they do choose, like, are they going to continue their career or are they going to stay at home? And I think, obviously, institutions, there are, um, you know, like work institutions, there are still gaps there, like the support, you know, maternity leave, like you said. Are you going to come back? Are you going to come back to the same role? Has someone overtaken you in the, you know, the ladder? Um, but at the same time, I think that we as women, like we do have that choice and we should remember that we have that choice. As long as we've got the support from our parents, you know, as younger girls, because we do, most of us go to uni, most of us get educated. I think the rest is like, we shouldn't just say, oh, um, so-and-so didn't do this because there was a lack of opportunity. It's also sometimes people choose, don't they? They choose to, you know, take a sort of a step back in one aspect, maybe in the career aspect of becoming a leader and becoming a leader of their home and nurturing their children. OK, that's a good point. So, sorry, I'm going to have to move on to other people who've got questions. I think there's one right at the back. I hope that was OK. In terms of, yeah, we can, so we'll come back. Yeah, sure, as a supplementary point. So, actually, the next question comes from... Uh, it's, it's coming from Indy. Uh, oh, right. He's coming. <laughs> So, um, uh, is India everyone to um, co-lead of the EYC Absolutely. network? Um, I wanted to ask in terms of opportunity, so for the individuals who have had opportunities to lead Sikh organisations, whether it's Everything 13, whether it's Carter Aid or EYC <coughs> network, what difficulties have you faced being Sikh women and being leaders in those organisations? Oh, okay, do you want to take that one first? Yeah. Okay, where do I start? Um, I think it's, uh, in our community has been the greatest challenge. Um, if I go and speak to somebody about something, it's changed now, but say five years ago, I would get a different response to had it been a male that went and asked, especially going into Gurdwara committees, um, just walking in. And this, they're very dismissive, but I know that if a man was sitting there, there'd be a certain level of respect already, just for the fact that he's been born a male. So um, that, that is, is, is a marked observation I think you find that a lot but I don't know whether I've become stronger and I've become more resilient things are changing now and with my role with the Sikh Council I've had to be a bit more assertive 
<laughs> so, um, yeah, I think that culturally, culturally is an issue. Yeah. Um, also, I think you sort of, with time, you sort of have to grow thicker skin mm. to take it on. And I mean, obviously, I'm not from Punjabi culture, <coughs> but I've had my fair share of experiences <laughs> when people are just like talking Gordia. <laughs> 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 So, um, but did, you, did you want to tell us that story? No, 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 no. <laughs> um, yeah. So I mean, I mean, obviously you're supporting Jagraj. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jagraj but actually in, in our organisation uh, we sort of made sure that we, apart from two male parcharaks, people who do talk about Sikhi, there is also a female employed on the same role. And uh, so, as obviously Guru Amar Das Ji, he uh, encouraged women. There was out of, I think, 140 manjis, the sort of preachers, third of them were women. So Guru Amar Das Ji laid this in the foundations of, of, of Sikhi. So women have to be in the leadership role, maybe not as half-half, but at least one-third have to be there. Absolutely, that's really good answers. Thank you. Um, we've got a, a question at the front here. Okay, so I've so got one question. more question at the back as next well. We'll come back to you afterwards, yeah. Sorry. Next question comes from um, Gurmail Singh, who's the General Secretary of Sea Council. Yes, thank you very much. Why good you Khalsa? Why good you Fateh? My, my, mine is a simple question. And the question is, how do we, or how are we going to get a sick woman into the House of Lords? Because I think this is now time that we raise the ambition and we create pathways which are supported by the communities to realize that ambition. So from the panel, my question is, what pathways need to be created for a sick woman to be in the House of Lords in five years? In five years? OK. It's quite a long time, isn't it? Um, so I don't do you, um, think, have you got some ideas on that? There's a, well, politics I mean, because, uh, is not our field, but I guess as a community, we have to I mean, get if you look at those the, women. We have to support them. If the baronesses to today, they come from all kinds of different backgrounds. Some of them are quite young as well. Quite a lot of yeah. Muslim ones, aren't there? Well, there's no thing. reason why a sick woman shouldn't be in the House of Lords. I agree, it's well overdue. Five years, why not next year? But you know, as a community, I think we need to promote the talent within our own community. We, t we need to sort of make that as public as possible so that we can lobby the right people to get the support, to get uh, women within our community put into positions that we want to be represented too. So I think the sort of onus lies on us collectively to identify the, the talent within uh, our midst and to promote that as far as we can to make sure it happens. Really. Doesn't it depend on who fills the form out? Could do, I don't and know. And, I a don't bit and a bit well, of lobbying, I, I think, well, and a lobbying that needs to take place to make sure that you're talking to the right people who can put your form in. It could do, but it's up to us to try and make, take control of that in some sense, isn't it, really? That's okay. the only way it's really going to happen, and that we get someone there that's going to be a positive image for the community and not someone that perhaps may not be as positive as we would like them to be. Absolutely. And I think it's interesting, when you do look at some of the people that do make it to House of Lords, that you know, a lot of them have done a lot of charity work. You know, they've been serving in the community, um, doing lots of projects as well. Um, so we need to get, make sure we've got hold of the right people who fill the form out. Mm. Right, so there's a question at the back, I think. So the next question comes from Jay from East London. Um, I haven't really got a question. Um, I just really wanted to, to, to kind of raise uh, a thought okay. on, on this area. Uh, I work in recruitment, um, so part of, part of my job, unfortunately, is on the, on the phone all day, um, talking to, to managers, talking to clients. And personally, I am seeing uh, a lot more women um, in, in an equal role to a man. A lot of companies, 50%, I'd say, are now women. What I'm still not seeing is, is obviously more percentage of, of, of Sikh women uh, coming into that. And it, it's a point that I was, I, was, I was thinking to myself, we have been blessed with, with Sikhi uh, from our gurus that, that we are equal to men and, 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 and sorry, <laughs> women, uh, women and men are equal. Um, and I feel still there is a lot of, as, as people are saying, cultural barriers um, with, with Sikh women. And what I'd like to see is, 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 is women in, in Sikhi to really start putting their foot down and thinking, you know what, I can get to the top and, you know, not to be limited by family, like I, I belong to my brother, I belong to my father. Break these limits. The, the world is out there to, to get it. Everyone else is capable of it. That there are, there are, as I said, I'm seeing a lot more women coming to other roles. There's no reason why women in Sikhi can do, do the same. Um, I think it's really about focusing back to Sikhi. So I think sometimes in our culture we are, we, are, we are going away from that. And I know it's hard with how families and how you've been brought uh, brought up and, and so forth, but I think it's impossible to really listen to, to our gurus and have a look at, at some of the examples um, that, that, that obviously our, our Singhis and, and Bibi in the past, uh, past have laid down for us and, and really 
let Guru uh, and these examples give you the strength to actually take you to the top and, and reach the ambitions. Um, I just wanted to, to say that point. Carlos, I want to go to you for today. Great. I think we've, got, we've had too much on this side and not enough on this side. <laughs> okay, so it's your chance to, uh, to uh, equalise it. Sure. So we've got a question here from Jay Breed from United Sikhs. Um, okay, so um, my, it's just an opinion really. Um, I feel that um, one of the barriers in our society is that women don't support each other enough. So how can we overcome that and work together as women as well? I'm glad you raised that because it's in my notes as well. Uh, the Daily Mail and the Daily Telegraph last week had an article saying that when women are in positions of power, they tend to, if you look statistically, at the women that progress in that organisation, they don't. Okay. Now, an example is, you know, I'm not doing politics here, Margaret Thatcher was in a position of power, but how many women came through? It was only in recent uh, electoral terms we saw that. So I, I, I'd like to ask you guys out there if you agree with me or disagree with me about the fact that do you think that women in positions of power hold back other women to actually progress? You may not like that comment. <coughs> Um, Amajit Singh, who's the sponsoring partner of the EY Sikh Network. Um, it, it's interesting you, that I, I, I missed that article in the Telegraph and the, and the Mail, but um, it, it's, com it's quite counterintuitive to what we find uh, in our firm and what we also find anecdotally when, when, when we talk to people from, say, the Women's Network, because actually what we see in, in a lot of financial institutions in the city is that where you have a woman or actually somebody from, uh, from a non, uh, from, a, uh, from an ethnic minority background in a leadership position and you look below them, what you actually see is a lot more women in that team or a lot more ethnic minorities in that team. Now, so, so it's, it's, it's interesting and I wonder whether that, uh, those, those surveys are actually much more from a, from a sort of CEO type position, but what you see anecdotally across the city and it's interesting because our women's network had the same sort of finding, was that actually if you had teams being actually led by women, there were actually far more women in the team. If your team's being led by somebody from an ethnic minority, there were a lot more ethnic minorities in the team. So okay. It's interesting. Let me just get, put this uh, study into context here. This study was done for senior management. Uh, it was, there was a separate study that was done from the University of Maryland uh, and uh, the Robert H. Uh, Smith, uh, Smith School of Business and uh, Columbia Business School. They analysed over 20 years of stock market data, um, an index of 1,500 US listed companies uh, in top management positions, not necessarily CEOs. And the question in terms of the, which was put forward, is there an implicit quota on women in top management with a resounding startling yes? That means that people that are senior, not necessarily women, but people in senior management are blocking women from progressing, okay, in their opinion. Okay? because statistics are good because you can do anything with them, as we know, right? Um, uh, sorry, sure, sure. Bit, because uh, I do echo Amarjeet Singh's comment a little bit. I think if you, if you look at the, the changing dynamics since sort of the mid-80s, 90s, and now where we are today, I think where you have the, the sort of middle management, you certainly see that there are more women, and yes, they are more collaborative, and, and I think the diversity initiatives in most of the sort of corporates are well rooted, and so you see that change. What you do find is the more senior uh, the position, the pool does start shrinking, and there are all sorts of reasons why there are less women in that pool. But when you do speak to senior women who are in executive positions, uh, you will find that because they're playing in a, in a playing field, that is with men, they're actually forgetting that they're women. They're dealing with the men on equal terms. At that point, nobody's really thinking, I need to drag a woman up. They're just picking the best person for the job. And okay. if, if the pool is restricted because people just haven't come up the chain, I think it's a cycle of time because we do have more middle management now. If people stick at their careers a little bit more, I think we will get that trajectory. So you don't think it's a vicious thing that maybe somebody suggested, which is I that women are holding women back? No, I don't. Because I think, I mean, if, you, if, you, if, if I look at my own experience, generally speaking, uh, I, I have had two really good... Uh, female mentors in my career, one of them American, one of them um, British, and they had absolutely no reason to ever speak to me, but they did. And, uh, you know, and I, I personally find that actually when I recruit, um, I have to stop myself being, um, you know, I've, I'm very open to both 
male-female recruitment, but when I've recruited a female, I'm, because I've been through that cycle, I'm, I'm almost preempting them, and I sometimes have to stop and say, let them ask, rather than keep offering stuff, because it's, it's almost intuitive to do that. So I, and I, I'm not unique in that. I know that other people do the same. So I think 20 years ago, yes, it, it was more vicious. I think where we're going to is getting better. OK, so let's, uh, before we move on to the next bit, just a quick summary on what we've been talking about. Drive, opportunity, um, support of the families is, is there as well. Uh, making sure that you do the right thing, you know. So opportunity also comes that something that you drive yourself, mm. right? Perspective is also important as well. And then we discussed just now uh, aspects of um, whether people really are holding other people back. OK, so we're taking a break right now. We'll see you straight after. Okay, thank you. We're back now to the next part of the show. Uh, there are a few questions earlier on that people were dying to ask. I'm going to hand over directly into the corner here to bring the question up from the previous question that we were covering, which was about uh, women in leadership as well. So please uh, stand up and uh, tell us what uh, question you've got or your viewpoint. So this question comes from Abey Singh. Thank you very much, Satsri Akal. Um, this question might appear a little counterintuitive, but the premise of it is based on the humanism, the inherent humanism of Sikhism. Um, whenever we talk about gender justice and gender crime and the pursuit of gender justice, we look at it from a very gender-specific prism. And that's a counterintuitive bit. I've always understood it to be a very humanistic perspective and pursuit. Um, in my family, for instance, it just so happens, and it's not about man or woman, that the men cook better, clean better, and iron better. And we don't, we, I've, never, I've never thought that this is the job of a man or a woman. And that's the great advantage we have culturally as well, um, Sikhs and all of the Dharmic faith. Um, we have the, sh the same inherent humanism. And I'm, I really wonder sometimes why we're so entrenched in the gender-specific view of all of this, because it's so much simpler psychologically intellectually and emotionally when you look at it through humanistic perspectives. Yeah, it's, it, it is an interesting point. Would you look at, you know, the top cooks and people like that? You know. the top cooks, the top chefs, you know, they all seem to be male. But, I, I mean, I, I, it's a valid point. Let me, um, I think there was somebody on the so left-hand side that wanted to we come through. Okay, we've got a question from Jaswinder. Hi, Vaikuchi Gakalsa, Vaikuchi Gifate. Uh, the consensus I seem to be picking up and is something I wanted the panel to agree is that we've talked a lot of barriers and is it therefore the biggest barriers we are facing is within our own families and within our own communities rather than the general public. Now I've been working uh, for a very long time, a lot older than most of you, probably old enough to be your mothers. Mm -hmm. Now um, I started working in the city when I was 18, I left school and then I went back to university got married in the traditional uh, role and the biggest barrier I found was my own mother who always, despite the education, I had to fight with her for my education and with her to go out to work. Now, education, job opportunities have always been there. I haven't faced any direct discrimination as far as I can think ever. So. I would have thought it's better uh, down to ourselves and the hard work. I mean, we've got Benji here, who's a former mayor of Greenwich. And the opportunities have always been there. I'm in the legal world, and I've been a lawyer for over 20 years. We've got very successful women in the law. We've got about at least five judges in the law, um, in the courts of a Sikh heritage. Now... The difference I have found is that the networking opportunities that the youngsters have now started, those networking opportunities weren't there for me and my group. We all became doctors, we all became lawyers, but we did a network with each other and we discouraged each other or in the law or other professions. When I met other Sikh women or other Asian women, we didn't talk to each other. So I would have thought the biggest barrier is within ourselves. But the opportunities, and it's all down to hard work. And if there are barriers, you've just got to break those barriers. Mm -hmm. And I carry on working. I carried on working throughout my pregnancies. I carried on working. I sat my law society exams when I was eight months pregnant. 
you know, and I worked continuously whilst my kids were under five. So, you know, it's down to hard work. But the great thing about the young and the younger generation is that you are here with EY, and at that time these opportunities didn't exist, but we still made it. Really so good. I just wanted to ask you, is it the consensus that the biggest barriers we are facing are within our own Sikh communities? And I think Bell touched upon the Gudwara committees. Whenever I have tried to make progress at a Gudwara, it has always, I've always been assigned to longer duties and nothing else. Yeah. You know? Right. So I've left. I've left that community I belong to in the Gudwara because I could do seva you know, for 24 hours, and hopefully I, I should carry on. But the mere fact was that our own communities do not like to see us progress. And lo and behold, if I ever mentioned that I was a lawyer, because nobody wants to know us, you know. Nobody wanted to marry us because we were lawyers. <laughs> I, I think some of us have been on the back end of somebody saying, um, there's a bit of a shortage of rotiyan. Can the BBM please come forward <laughs> and make rotis down in the Lunga Hall? Which is a bit kind of a, a conflict with the fact that, you know, uh, we, we really need to uh, get past that. Ramjit, you want to say something? I want to bring Bao Kay back in as well. And I think we want to just close up with one comment I think you want to make as well, don't you? Thank you. I, I just wanted to pick up a little bit on um, perhaps the sort of the cultural barriers that we're talking about. And, and I think. Yes, there is a consensus that the, the, the handicap may be within, within our own um, community. I mean, one, one of the reasons why I volunteered to go into the Sikh Council UK was because I felt, okay, I've done the career thing, feel home is great. Now I'm just looking around and thinking, well, why can't I speak on some issues that are really dear to me? And it, it was very interesting because um, I, I don't belong to any sort of, I, I hadn't been any committees and the Sikh Council was organised initially as a drive to bring Gurdwaras together, all sorts of walks of Sikhi coming together under a single, single umbrella and um, don't blush but I, you know, when, when I talked to Gumail Singh he was kind of like, okay we're going to fix this, we're going to try and get this. So I went to my local Gurdwara and I can tell you my toughest interview experience was going to the local Gurdwara committee. It, it really was very daunting and they didn't pick me. Uh, no. <laughs> so I, I got picked actually to be a, a representative member of a Gurdwara in a, in a city 200 miles away from where I live, simply because they'd heard me speak and they said, fine, come along. So there, there's a real good story there that actually people who wanted someone like me to, to speak for them said, yes, please represent us. Uh, I had a bit of a tougher job with my local, which was interesting. But then coming into the, the council itself, um, I'll just go back to something that Sukhmani Kaur said earlier, that you know, I think we as women have gone through a journey of, 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 you know, we all have different identities. And I think the identity, when you're working within the community, it takes a while to harden up because uh, it is quite rough and tumble sometimes, and you don't get heard, and you are quite often the only female voice. I found myself, uh, I was a a bit of a chicken actually when I first started. Um, now I'm a lot tougher, a lot more bristly. So, but it takes, it is a journey. And I think I would say that today, where we are today, we can all speak pretty loudly. And if we have succeeded in our careers and we have succeeded in our homes, it is time that we do succeed in broader society. So I think going back to the comment that was made, can we have a, a, a Sikh woman in the House of Lords? Yes, that will be down to us to propose and promote and, and lobby for that. But actually, I think we should have many, many more sick women in, in the political spectrum through local government and, and through the elected process because that you actually have to put yourself forward for and you have to have those beliefs and push yourself forward. So I think that's something we don't particularly do uh, today. I hate to say this, but there's like millions of Sikh organisations, aren't there? Right, they're all vying for position, you know, call seek that, seek this, whatever, you know. Um, that makes it difficult, doesn't it? I mean, tell, I mean, your experience. I think I know the divisions it amongst us as a community make everything difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, you've got all these little sects from different Sikh organisations. If somebody does something, you have ten other people wanting to mimic the same thing. We don't strengthen what we have. We want to compete with each other, and we don't realise that actually weakens us as a community. And Appreciate that. Sorry, Nisha. Yes. So I was going to add something. So I think. We talk about, you know, like more girls should put themselves, more women should put themselves forward in these leadership positions. But I think it all is also the duty of everybody to make sure that when women do want to be heard and they do come forward, there's an environment that they feel comfortable in and that they're not actually deterred from doing that. Because 
Like, for example, like, I've been, you know, I've first female lead of this network. I've turned up to quite a few of these sort of, you know, networking events of other organisations. And I've, and even, actually, at, even at these own events that we've hosted a few months ago, I mean, I've been pushed out of the way and people want to speak to Indy. And look at the size of him and look at the size of me. How am I going to compete with that? It's true, isn't it? And, it's, it, you know, being, like, I'm only, you know, I look quite young as well. So people, like, kind of like, oh, who's she, that child talking to me? You know, but th those are the barriers that we face. Because um, people, you know, I think women, we want to be spoken. It takes, I think, for us to move forward, you know, it takes that much more confident. I think you have to be a lot more confident as a woman than a man to put yourself forward. You see, because you're going into an environment where you already know that it's quite male dominated and that you're going to have to compete that much more, try to prove yourself. But at the same time, when we finally do, you know, you're kind of, you, you, it's up to the rest of the community to make sure that actually, you know, you're made to feel comfortable and that actually will push more females forward. Because we can see, even what I referred to before, we even see on social media, like, you know, you've got um, Cause Corner, you've got Core Life, like all these little groups and everyone's, you know, they're all speaking out and, you know, it shows that people do have a voice. But why is it that they feel like they have to speak? I mean, social media is very powerful, but it's, you know, they should bring themselves forward. And we should, everyone should be saying, oh, you know, so happy that there are women moving forward because then automatically we'll have not just one person in the House of Lords and one person in, like, we'll be happy with one MEP or, you know, there'll be a lot more. Okay, so I think we need to. Um, yep. I think so we we'll just do one very quickly, if you don't mind. From uh, Brittany from the EY Seek Network. Okay. Hi, I just want to ask whether we're doing enough as mothers, well, not me personally, but generally mothers within our society to bring up their children, boys and girls, with the similar same values, because obviously our religion is about equality, but it starts at home. So culturally, are we doing enough to bring up the girls? daughters and sons in the same way in the I'm, respects of... I'm glad you said that because the next question is specifically oh, okay. around that and I, I just really wanted to go around the table and let me, let me take that question that you got there. Um, the second topic that we're supposed to be talking about is the changing role of women in society and how they relate to this as being Sikhs, which is quite close to what you said. So does religion inspire the multiple roles that women play, right? To paraphrase a little bit of what you said, right? But I mean, could you... Could you so many, First, and then after that, I'll come to the Sing Twins. Um, I sort of look through it at this um, through the point, um, through the perspective of um, Sikhi for me is to um, inspire other people to to love Guru. So that's what Sikhi is for me. So I try to do it on all the levels of my life. So if it's with my children or if it's outside, a sort of um, with the, with the, our playgroup, for example. We're trying to in, sort of encourage families to to come together and talk about the sort of about Sikhi topics. So maybe it's on a very basic level, but um, for th this, this is for me what Sikhi is to to manifest it through through all sort of um, through all levels of your life. It, it is interesting. It's good when you uh, go to Wikipedia and you type in Sikh women because there is a subject called Sikh women in uh, Wikipedia. Surprisingly. It says the role of women in Sikhism is outlined in the Sikh scriptures which state that women are to be regarded as equal to men. In Sikhism, women are considered to have the same souls as men and equal rights to grow spiritually. They're allowed to lead religious congregations, take part in the Kanbat, um, perform Kirtan, work as Guntis, and participate in all religious, cultural, social and secular activities. As such, Sikhism was amongst the first of the main religions in the world to imply that women were equal to men. Guru Nanak proclaimed that equality of men and women and both he and the gurus that succeeded him allowed women to take full part in the activities of Sikh worship and practice. So I wanted to bring the Sikh, uh, the, uh, the Sikh twins in now. Now this question that we've got here that I'd like to discuss in more detail with the rest of the show that we've got here is really about religion inspiring the multiple roles that women actually play. Do you agree with that statement? Well, from, from a personal perspective, uh, yes, I would say that our Sikh teachings and background has definitely influenced the way that we work as artists. I mean, our work has a, a purpose. Um, it has a social and political conscience. All that comes from our Sikh 
background and yeah, but what about as, in terms of your role but, in, in family, not well, necessarily your I'm career? Well, I was going to come to that, that it's obviously on that side of the career, but also you do have a duty within the family too, so you have to balance. I mean, the family is as important as having a career. I think that comes from the teachings and the whole meedy beedy aspect, and that, you know, you find spirituality through um, your day-to-day -day life, and that part of that is through serving others and serving members of your own family. So whether it be your duty as a daughter or a mother or you know wife or whatever, that's just as important as following your chosen career. Do you think that, that that phrase, which is charity, brings, begins at home mm -hmm. and the kind of servile element? If you replace that, you know, and you think, think about servile as ch charity as servile as well, isn't it? A lot of our earlier work dealt with this whole issue. It's all tied into this idea of individuality, and we as twins actually were criticised quite a lot as contemporary artists for not being individual enough. There seemed to be this big em emphasis on being an individual. And um, we challenged that, I think, coming from a, a non-European position where that's such a big concept, um, coming from a, a background where it was family and community was, was more important than the individual, we started to paint um, works that depicted and celebrated the idea of the extended family, for example, and in the way that that extended family is used as a training ground to give and take and to be less selfish and to, to learn to serve others. It starts within the home and then you take those qualities out to the, the wider community. I'm going to open this up to the audience. Uh, thank you for, for your comments. I, f I found it really interesting to see how there's been such a positive discussion around how women can get ahead in their careers and, and in, the, in the wider world. But, um, I mean, one of the issues that we still have to remember is that within the Sikh, especially the Punjabi diaspora for women, there's still um, incredibly, sickeningly high levels of violence. You know, we've got honour violence, we've got the highest levels of um, female infanticide, feticide. Um, you know, um, in, uh, rape in the home, abuse in the home. Um, and we see this, you know, as, a, as an issue that's kind of often swept under the carpet. Now, I, I mean, it's, it's so positive that our, our women in Britain today can reach the heights that all of this panel are achieving. I'm personally very privileged to be able to be doing a PhD at a university like Oxford, and my family have supported me. But previous generations of my family, and I have to say it, it's quite sad, but you know, I, can, I know of instances now, even today, young women myself, that haven't been treated as well as they deserve to be, even though our religion preaches equality because of our culture. How, I, my question to the panel is, how can we affect change and how can we now use our stronger position as women in the Western world to bring change uh, to those that are still stuck in positions much less fortunate than ourselves? That's a really great question. Thank you so much for the contribution. I think there's also dynamics in the family that, that have a part to play as well in terms of you know, where you find yourself and what they might be thinking or how they think as well. Did you want to address that, uh, Balke, about do you think that family dynamics make a difference or do you think that there is, especially, I mean, you've, you've done a lot of charity work. Do you see that there are still inherent problems with you know, honour issues, with kind of there violence are. in the home, you know, because people don't actually understand that the role of women anyway. There are, but I don't know if we can make the statement that they're sickeningly high in our community. I think across the South Asian communities, yeah. I'd be a bit hesitant to say that Sikhs have a high rate, because we don't know that. But obviously with people that maybe haven't got the education or other anger management issues, whatever, in the house, there are, these issues do exist. And I think those of us that are here, and people like us, professionals that are educated, I think it does fall upon us, really, to try and educate people and raise awareness and where people can seek help and what have you. And as always, our good daughters remain our point to, to reach out to people. So we want to go down the route of um, talking about Gurdwara role or whatever, but can, can women make a difference in the house, though, in terms of if their dynamic is so strong and resistant against that, you know, in terms of a change or a change of attitude or whatever, you know? I think it's difficult. It's difficult. It's difficult. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, but it's not to say we shouldn't give up. We should give no, up. No, There's we should, got to we be innovative up. ways of doing that. And there are a lot of groups that are getting together which are providing advice or shelter or whatever. Um, got another question in the corner. So, Indy has a follow-up question. Uh, this one's specifically for Bao. So, talk, going from violence inside the home and as your role as chairman of, of Carlsa Aid, um, violence in the wider world and working in disaster zones and war zones, um, what has your experience been as a, as a female working in that area? And would you in the future let your daughter go out on a humanitarian aid mission to places like Iraq, Syria, or the Congo, for example? 
No. <laughs> no. And I've got to say, we get... Average, we get about 10 people that want to volunteer on a daily basis with Carl to Aid. About eight of those will be females, and there'll be some young girls that have never really travelled on their own, and they want to go to places like Libya, Lebanon, Iraq, Syria. And <laughs> when I explain to them, you're not going... I mean, yeah, but I thought men and women were equal in Sikhi. Yes, you are, but there's, you, you can contribute in a different way. We're not going to put you in a high-risk area because the world is, it is a man's world at the end of the day and a woman won't be able to defend herself as maybe as well as a man could. Um, and obviously women face different challenges and risks. So no is a short answer to that. So let's, let's put this question wider out into the audience as well. I, I think you wanted to come back, didn't you? Um, I'm specifically around the changing role of women in society. Um, do you think that women, uh, the, the roles are changing today? You know, I mean, you've, I mean, you, you, you have done work for um, a number of organisations, haven't you? It was mentioned earlier on. The issue I have in my mind is, are the boys of today sporting women as much they should be? Because our progress is not just because of um, dedication, commitment, or passion of a woman, which I can say I have achieved. Fortunately, Galpur has given it to me. But all these youngsters here are today should promise that they will support women, although they are married, who has married or not married, parents are saying get married or not married. The support is very important for any progress in women's life, whether through the religion, whether through the work or through there. So I think if we say it does play a role, the request will be everyone around, in and out of the religion should be supporting women so that we can progress forward and there will be more roles and more people to inspire in future if we can get there. Okay, Thank so you these very are much. really good points that have been brought here about the fact that you know the next generation or the current generation need to provide that support network as well. Yes. Unfortunately there is the politics of the household in terms of you're not on your own. You know, you've got mother-in-laws and other people that may think in different ways. So you know there is obviously the challenge there. That's not to say that you shouldn't take it on. Do we have another question? Yes, yes, we have a question here from Sook from Harrow. Hiya. Um, thank you, all the panellists, for giving up your time. And uh, thank you, Anson Young, for um, great building and the, um, uh, just getting us all together here today. Um, I think a couple of points. Um, if I talk about my own experiences through education and um, in law, Every school or university I've been to, the Sikh girls work a lot harder than the Sikh boys. Um, so I think the future's bright. I think um, it's a generational thing as well. And I think in our generation, there'll be a lot more Asians in law and medicine and banking and accounting. And there'll be a lot more Asian boys and there'll be a lot more Asian girls. But if I think about how hard Sikh girls used to work, they'll be fine. Um, they'll, be, they'll be running the show in a few years. Um, I think the second point I want to make is that I think we can all talk about career achievements and they're very important and it's important to succeed in that world but I think probably the most important role I think for a Sikh woman is to instill Sikhi in children. I think um, if I think about my own childhood um, and just in terms of how much time a mother spends with the children compared to the father I think you know Sikh, Sikh girls, young Sikh girls also need to understand that you know, while career achievement is great and we, we want you to succeed and get to the top, we also want you to instill those Sikhi values. Um, they're just as important as working hard and going to red brick universities and, you know, working in the city, etc. But, sorry, just a comment back. Do you, do you not feel that that, should, that role should be shared, though, with the fathers as well? If, if their mothers taught them, and, you know, if you're the youth, then, you know, you're starting to... Um, you know, as the youth the males, you should be supporting women coming forward. And you said that the girls are working harder. Is it not your role then as well to share that burden almost, or that, you know, blessing and instill Sikhi into your children? I think it is, and, and you're absolutely right, is that it's the guy's role as well. And particularly if maybe sometimes the husband's more, more spiritually advanced than, than, than his wife, then obviously he has to do more. But I just think, think in terms of, especially at a younger age, the mother's going to spend more time. Um, I think that's that's factual. It's realistic. So, um, without you know, without getting into a big debate, I think 
it's, it's important that the values and Sikhi also comes from the mother. So the mother actually has a very empowered role already because she's going to shape the children in the embryonic stage of their lives. Thank you so much for that contribution. We've got another We've got a follow I think up. there's another point in the front as well afterwards. Yeah? So okay, a follow-up question yeah. from Amen. It's not so much a question, it's probably an opinion as a young, educated Sikh mother. Um, I believe it stems from education, education at home. I thoroughly believe 100% that what a mother can give to a child is amazing, as Baji said. But I also believe that a lot of what comes from me is from my father as well. Um, Growing up, I think it's important in the home that both men and women play a dynamic role and show how either a mother or a father can achieve success in the workplace, in their careers. And I think that's really important for a child to see so that they can then go on in life and be leaders. It's not just about men being successful or a woman being successful. It's about having a balance um, as being a parent so that your child can see that those doors are open for them but also so that other people can be inspired so fellow parents can see that there's different ways of parenting apart from the traditional cultural way of the mum staying at home and raising the children and teaching them about sikhi and life skills I think it's important that a father does it sure. but I think it's important that it's given, the skills are given to a child who's female and male, because that's when we're going to see the difference in the working environment, because those children are then going to go on to become leaders, and that's what we want, but we want leaders from the Sikh faith as well. And only with support from family does that really come about. Yeah. Like, I was lucky enough not to face any of the issues that Benji faced, um, and that was because my grandfather was so supportive of education so this cultural barrier that people speak about from, older, from the older generation, I think for so long people have been trying to educate them or show them a different perspective. But really we should focus on educating our younger generations so that they learn about equality at home. So like Baji said, that the men can cook better than the women and I am better than the women. Well, th that's how society should be. Our sons and daughters should have the same skill set at home and in the wi wider work world. Thank you for that. Uh, did you want to make... Uh, you're OK. So we're moving on to the right-hand side. Uh, Varun from Tech Startup Hubble. Um, I was just going to say, it's probably worth mentioning that there is a peer in the House of Lords, uh, Baroness Sandeep Verma, who is of Sikh lineage. So more progress has been made than, uh, than okay. might have originally been mentioned. Um, uh, my question is, uh, a few months ago, uh, you might remember, um, in the Church of England, there was a big story about women who were admitted to become, allowed, they were allowed to become bishops. Um, my question is, um, should, um, you know, should Sikhs or in, in other religions as well, um, be more prescriptive in the same way about having women in such um, in some of the highest leadership roles within the Gurdwara because I know uh, some, some people mentioned having them on the committee but what about in the actual religious leadership roles themselves? Yeah, actually Pramjit wants to take this I think because only of your recent uh, exposure to uh, <laughs> certain work that you're doing at the moment. Yeah, actually I wanted to share something um, really beautiful because uh, a couple of, about a month ago I spoke at the um, Sikh Women's Alliance uh, day where they were celebrating the International Women's Day. And uh, one of my co-speakers was the author of the biography that's been written for uh, Bibi Balwant Korsur, uh, popularly, uh, popularly known as Bibiji, uh, who's pop very much acknowledged as a, as a, as a Brahm Gyani. She was, she was a, a tremendous woman. So we talk about Sikh role, role models and you talk about the role of women in Sikhi. Uh, this is a lady who was born in 1915 widowed at 23, had four children, and she lived in India, in uh, Kenya, <coughs> and in, in the UK. 
she is widely um, acknowledged for being the person who started the Istri Satsang Sabha, and she's got the Guru Bebenanki Jatha, which is which has got hundreds of women who do huge fundraising. They do huge amounts of charitable work for uh, orphan children, for the victims of, of uh, genocide, uh, massacres, etc. And she pretty much single-handedly raised the campaign to create a, a long-term memorial for Bebenanki, who's the first female Sikh, Gursik. Uh, and so I think the spiritual role model of Sikhi actually stems from Bebenanki. <laughs> And uh, all of us who are kind of thinking about what can we do, and I just wanted to come back to the comment about, uh, you know, violence in the home, anger issues, and, and people who are genuinely trapped in homes where they, they can't seem to find a way out or there isn't a way out. And I would say that as good six, whether you're male or female, if you're, if, if you're born in a household where you're, you're given the mol mantar, you, you are taught how to be, you know, think about the nirpo, nirvar, so become more fearless, be God-fearing, be strong. One of the core fundamentals, whether you're a man or a woman, is to actually be stand up, stand up and be strong and, be, and count, get, get counted. And I think that strength, we don't always have it on our own. We get it from Sangat. So if, if you're talking about how do we as a community become stronger, how do we achieve more, we have to go back to the basics of what our gurus told us, you know. And the principles of Guru Sikhi start with, as Benji was saying, you know, Nimrata, Simran. And it starts very, very simply with, you know, Vaheguru Simran, Mulmanta. So I think where people are in a situation where they can't help themselves, the, the solution really is education, it is participation in, in bigger Sangat groups. I think somebody wanted to come yeah. in here, and then we have, to, we're going to go to the side here. You've been standing yeah. here, should we sit down for a second? <laughs> um, um, basically, Guruji told us, he said, Babanya Kahaniya, Sud Putsa Karin. So, if you teach your children the stories of the Gurus, they'll become good children. They'll be on the right path. So, we don't have to think twice, actually. Everything is <laughs> written for us, everything is given for us. Another point, which Penji was saying, going back to basics, um, Guruji actually said that all the people are female in, fr in front of Waheguru. So, even men are actually women for Waheguru, and Waheguru is our husband. So if actually people sort of try to understand it, it's a, it's a hard concept to understand that all the, we are all souls trying to join to our husband Lord, Vahiguru. And if we all look at, the, at life from this perspective, I think a lot of things can change and a lot of problems of violence and um, where uh, women are being suppressed, they won't be there. Absolutely. So we're coming to the side here. Okay, we've got um, Parvinda from Buckinghamshire. Oh, hello. Uh, but I know we've spoken a lot about, um, sorry, a bit nervous now. <laughs> we've spoken about um, women on the domestic level in power, and we've spoken about mental, physical abuse that goes on in our communities. I just want to say, on the other side of that, women are also perpetrators. Um, I don't have anything like statistics to prove this, or by, uh, no, by numbers, but women are narcissistic, vindictive, and controlling. And unfortunately, they are the biggest downfall in our community. How can we live by our Namrita and Thiraj and Himmat if we can't see the bigger picture that we should be living in um, I feel that women um, is a vicious circle, unfortunately. They'll have, we'll have women who are very humble in humility and who won't stand up for these stronger personalities who are overtaking. Um, and I, and I just believe that, how, oh, sorry, I just want to ask, how can we start beginning to challenge these strong personalities? I believe it's through counselling and speaking out. Um, but there's not enough. In, um, I know of somebody who asked me a question about um, mental abuse, but they were so afraid to go to the Gurdwara to speak to somebody who was literally a brown face. Um, so we, I don't know how we can deal with some issues. I think issues. it's a really interesting topic area. I mean, do so you want to come in and say something about do you have any ideas on is there something that we can do in, in our own societies to help bring about change? It's when, difficult when it's within the so family resistant. home when you're dealing with individuals because it is basically down to human nature and, and, and how diverse human nature is within different families and you know how, how do you change people's attitudes even across the generations if you're born a particular way you have a particular perception, perception of life and, and uh, you may have a, a more sort of aggressive outlook on life. How, how do you change that person? I mean, that's a difficult question for anybody, whether it's you know, sick, non-sick, white, yeah. Asian. 
Um, as I, I, say, would, I would suggest that, I mean, if you look at it as, as Sikhs, that, you know, we're supposed to be defenders of the defenseless, right? Some of us don't want to go to knock on the next door neighbour and say, mm. how come we're hearing all this noise and that these people are being, you know, really abused? But maybe it's down to all of us. We expect other people to change, but we don't go out, okay, we might be accused of interfering or whatever, but we have a, you know, a part to play as well. We can't just leave it in the family and let the, the walls hear massive vibrations and people would, you know, suffer. So maybe we need, we need to be more courageous. Do you agree with that? Yeah, definitely. I think I do. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I want to bring in uh, Bao Kei because I think initially uh, there was a point made earlier on about obviously some of the disaster zones that you go into, you see some of this violence as well. And I know Angelina Jolie recently uh, was involved in a conference about uh, sexual violence against women, especially during the time of war. I know it's a slightly different context, but in the same way, you know, it's exposure, isn't it? It's kind of the first target to hit is to women. Specifically around your point was women are doing it to women. And it leads to isolation, so people think they can't speak out. Because when you do speak out or you take any steps, the community will victimise you. And you're almost demonised for going against the norm. So, for instance, if, if a woman's marriage breaks up, it's always the woman that's blamed. Nobody actually looks deeper into why or whatever. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And I think within our communities, we need to have some sort of support mechanisms where people feel safe they've got somebody that they can go and talk to. And unfortunately, I don't see that coming soon. Um, we just really need to change the mindset. I think uh, well, my, one of my suggestions personally would be that, you know, maybe we need to invest in more shelters and, and you know... Yeah, we, that we actually in this country, there isn't a, a centre for Sikh women or Sikh girls that are fleeing abuse. There isn't a shelter in this country. And often, uh, I know you, Budgie and I have had this conversation, that girls or women that are often suffering abuse within our community, they have to go outside of the community to have a, you know, a safe haven. And that often leads to further abuse and then their life sort of becomes quite um, diminished really and they, dysfunctional. That's so. a really excellent point. Thanks. So, sorry, do you want to say something? There's a trend that I've kind of seen recently with regards to this, because I know certain Gurdwara, they're actually sort of self, you know, setting up certain counselling sessions and things like that. But there's always part of the Sangat that say, oh, no, we shouldn't get involved, leave it to Guruji. And I, I know that that's what our religion says. But as a Sangat as well, like, if we see something is happening, it is still our role to step in. You know, the whole point is we should fight, we, you know, we, the, our foundations are about standing up against oppression. And I know at the end of the day, you know, we, ha we all have faith. But if something is wrong, you know, we are also here as well, soldiers as such to make sure that, you know, to help people when we can. So I think that sometimes when people, they're almost using Guruji as just something to hide behind because they don't want to step out and take action, which I don't think is fair. And I don't think it's right either. Absolutely, so we're hiding behind that. So, Indy, we've got one more question down here, haven't we? From Saran Bhatia from Sikh Helpline. Um, um, I wanted to um, point this question in the direction of the Singh twins. Um, I wanted to ask how open and how welcoming has the art sector been, from your personal opinion? And since we're talking about um, finding inspiration and who you can talk to, in your personal opinion, um, where did you see that encouragement and inspiration well, in your I journey? We've been quite, from what I've heard, quite blessed in a way. Uh, we agree with the young lady over there that most of our support has come from our family, uh, specifically our father and male m members of our family. So we've never had that uh, sense of being oppressed, you know, as a young Asian girl. And quite ironically, the, the obstacles we've had to face within the art world have actually come from the wider non sikh community. Um, for example, when we were at school, you know, there was this stereotype view of the poor, oppressed Asian girl. We originally started on the path of doing sciences. We wanted to pursue a career in medicine. Our teachers thought better. They, saw, they felt we were being pushed into, you know, the professional career option. And we're very proactive in actually um, sabotaging, actually, our, our chances of getting into medicine. <laughs> we ended up on a course doing art. We were fighting, kicking against doing art because it's not what we wanted to do. Then we got to our art degree, and it's a long story, but there was a major um, debate about what award would be given to our final dissertation, and it boiled down to one of the tutors being because pretty much it. prejudiced about the type of work we were doing because we were trying to say that Western art was influenced by non-Western art. And in the sort of debates that ensued in, in the uh, exam room, he apparently he, uh, threw a sort of derisory remark at our dissertation and said, 
give them that, they'll be happy with that because they'll be going off and getting married anyway. So again, it was going back to the stereotype of how other Not people say, perceive Asian young girls. Asian sick women. And I think partly that's our problem too because we don't do enough to promote uh, who we are as a community. We certainly don't, for example, take um, the opportunities of, of, of the media to actually promote positive images of who we are and the fact that, yes, there are these problems that we have within our community, but it is a stereotype. The negative stereotypes are not what we are all about. We do also get a lot of support from within our homes, within our communities, mm -hmm. and the battle that we have to face is very much the outside world. And also within the art, the art world itself, because it's so Eurocentric, this idea going back to sort of outdated views of colonialism and empire and, um, you know, West is best and Western superiority, that's very much something that has been uh, quite a challenge for us in our work because we are coming from such a traditional perspective in the style that we work in, but also the issues that we deal with within our paintings, which are very often about trying to counter the neg negative uh, media stereotypes that we faced as young six growing mm -hmm. up in Britain. Yeah. Well, in fact, that, I think the fact that we are women and chose eventually a career, or rather kind of fate pushed us in the direction of taking a career up in art has actually worked in our favour. I think if we'd have been male <coughs> six trying to pursue a career in art, I think there would have been more obstacles from within the community itself within the home, because I think there would have been the expectation that we were the primary, you know, bread earners and we, we had to have a family to look after and therefore we would have been encouraged more to go into one of the professional careers which had a more, you know, kind of stable income uh, at the end of it. Um, as such, because we were, were women, um, I think there wasn't that particular pressure on us uh, and so I think it is much easier for us as girls to pursue a career in art. Not so easy when you're in the wider world of, of art, because as we know, the, the art world is dominated by, by men throughout history. But within the community itself, ironically, being girls has actually been an advantage to us. Thank you for that. I think we've got one question here. I think that's, that, if anyone's got anything else, we, we're coming very rapidly to the end. Um, so yes, in, in the okay, corner. Okay, there's a question from Parvinder. And then we'll take a question from here afterwards in the front. Thank you. Hi there. Now, you mentioned a term earlier on the panel, which was uh, gender agnostic. Now, as Sikhs, we are supposed to be gender agnostic. Now, I see that religiously, we have the quality. However, culturally, we don't whatsoever. That, you know, we have it on certain degrees, but it's just not there, not to the extent that it should be. So, should we wait for change? I mean, as the panel mentioned here earlier, if they're sitting at Gordar, people say, oh no, it's all right, we just, you know, the Guruji will just deal with it. Or should we actually enforce change? If we should enforce change, how would you go about doing it? Now, at the moment, I see people go through struggles. Families experiencing experience struggles. For example, parents would disagree. Children would go against their parents. And maybe a few years later, they would have an amicable, you know, g getting together. And eventually, the parents would actually change. But that's a generational change. That was going to take a long time. Now, we have this forum, which is brilliant, and it's all about empowering women. Now, I was raised by a single mother, and I had four sisters and one brother. So I've had a lot of female influence in my life. Now, should we enforce change by empowering women, which we already have this in forum, or should we actually enforce change by educating and re-educating men? And seeing as this is more about Sikh women, I suppose we could say educating, re-educating Sikh men particularly. I think it's a really great question. So I think if you could answer the one about, uh, did you force your, force your way to get into the positions that you were in? Uh, do you think that education has a part to play? Is it better to educate the male to make sure that, you know, I mean, you had a very, you had someone, that, uh, a partner that, you know, who supported you and you supported him? I would say, you know, the education of the men and having a strong male supporter from a very young age is a very, very important part. I mean, I, I will share a personal story. As I, as I said earlier in the introduction, I'm, I'm uh, the fifth daughter uh, and in, in a family. And my mother went through the awful experience that when she had her third daughter, there was a family discussion in the clan as to whether my father should consider getting another one since this one wasn't going to give him a son. And my father put paid to that idea quite quickly. But that, that in itself, was a huge thing, given the time that this, this happened. Uh, but that's not to say that my mother didn't have uh, a rough ride because she had the daughters. So I think culturally we have those issues. But I would say 
um, I've in my life been inspired by how my father treated all of us girls. And then I've been very fortunate that, you know, I've been able to kind of have that strength to battle. I would say you need both. You need, you need very good, strong male role models who need to be educated on what it is to respect women and to encourage them to, to be human beings, equal human beings. Because that suppression that can come from the female, sometimes uh, I will go back to the comment that was made that sometimes women are doing uh, more harm to other women because they're enforcing stereotypes. And I think that comes from, uh, I relate to that a little bit because of the experience my mother went to because it was the women in the clan that were saying those things to my mother. And I think so, so the education has to happen at many, many levels. But I would say what we're doing here today, sitting in a room discussing these issues so openly is, is how you open the doors to, these, to the empowerment for both men and women. Because the more we talk about the issue, the more somebody else will get the courage to say, I recognize that, and maybe I can do X. So I think you do have to fight. I think young women have to make sure that they, they do feel empowered, and if they don't, they question why. And I think young men should be um, you, you know, participating in these discussions, and as, as we've talked about, bringing up children. The, the, the parents of today and tomorrow are so lucky because we are communicating very openly about these issues. 30 years ago, there wasn't this discussion. So I take hope from that. Fantastic. Um, yeah. Got one more point, I think, here in the front. Mm -hmm. We'll get the microphone here. And then I think that we've got it. We wrap. We've got one more, actually, after this. Uh, and then after that, we're getting very close to the end of the show. So thank you. Okay. Please pass your comments. I'd um, like to say thank you to all the panelists. I think you're all very inspiring. Um, and also to Ian Wire to create this forum because it gives young women, young Sikh women, a great opportunity to network and to learn about each other and get to know one another. Um, I think a key takeaway from all these conversations for myself is one, that Sikh women are very hard working. Um, but secondly, we're in a really good opportunity, we're in a really good position to make a change. And I think whilst we all have educations which our parents didn't previously have, we all have degrees. We now can take it to that next step. And I think really for next step, we need to network more. We need to, for like EMY, if you all work in banking, we need to create a more, I would say, um, a global international network where we can learn off each other. I think that can happen two ways. Um, I would say one, career-wise, we can help mentor the younger undergraduates, more junior members of staff. Um, and also for with senior management. And secondly, on the issue of domestic violence, um, the Godwood Committee is being very male-dominated. It can give us a real opportunity to really, well, why is there not a Sikh um, shelter for women? Why not? I'm really surprised there should be. It's a very big issue in the community. Why have we not addressed that? So I think what we should take away from this is we need to work together, network, um, be strong, be forward thinking, brainstorm. Um, we've taken it one step from my parents' generation, we need to take it to the next in terms of politics um, and in, I'd say, the professional sector as well. That's fantastic. Yeah. Um, I've got one more at the end, I think, and that's going to be it. I probably the only the only person represent brave enough to represent a uh, uh, Gordora and be openly uh, <laughs> open about it. Um, my question is actually uh, directed to uh, Anisha Kaur Seth. Um, so, it, regardless, what you could, so um, in, in the Gordora we do promote as many women to come forward. In my particular Gordora, the vice vice Pardan is actually it was the first Gordora to have a vice Pardan, and both of our state speakers, who the public and the Sangat see are both females as well. So the question I want to ask you, Anisha, is that what may, as somebody that's representing the young Sikh professional woman, how did you get involved? What made you get involved? And what support did you receive from the EY Sikh network and from EY to help you get to the position on top? Thank you for your question. Um, there are a lot of factors. So firstly, sort of to get the confidence and the personality that I have, I guess, to get to this point. 
um, I have to thank like my family and my mum in particular because my mum I mean I've always had a bit of a big mouth um, growing up and uh, I think I've always had quite a like sort of a personality that liked to question everything and which is it, you know in our community for girls to question things that, you know growing up it's you know it's shock horror really um, but I think that that's one of the biggest influences and I think if if a girl is questioning um, you know then it's up to the family firstly to support that and answer the questions and instead of saying oh you know just go sit in a corner um, don't ask anything. So that's not the way. Secondly, within EY, within here, like, I joined the network quite, only pretty much less, about a year ago, to be honest, I got involved here. And I think um, I got the support, again, because there were male leads. I actually got the support from the other male leads. It was actually indie. it was actually other people saying to me within the network, all males, no females, saying to me, you know what, um, I think you'd be really good. Uh, think about it. And straight away, I mean, like a normal normal woman, I said, oh, no. Oh, I don't know. I don't know about that. Um, you know, and that, that was my reaction straight away. And then they were like, no, 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 but think about it. Think about it. Like, personality traits, like your vocal, um, you know, you're good at organising <laughs> is one thing. And you, you, you don't mind speaking out there. You don't mind, you know, um, giving your opinion. So... I think that because I had that support, again, from a male network, I don't know why it gave me more confidence. Because then you know that almost, like I said before, like if, you go in, if you know that you're going to go into an environment where that they're going to make you feel comfortable, um, you think, actually, yeah, I can do it. Whereas if I was, going to, if I was met with adversity or you know, even a difficult situation, then um, I don't think it, I would have felt as confident in taking on this position that I... That I, that I am right now. Um, with regards to, say, the Gurdwara, this is another thing that, like, you know, I would like to say. So I, I don't know whether it, this is just going to, you know, just put, I'm just putting it out there, but you know when they're doing these committee AGMs and no one ever knows when it is, unfortunately, or whatever, um, you know, the bigger Gurdwara, that usually do take the steps and then, you know, the rest follow. And we have found that in the UK. There are certain key Gurdwara that do take those sort of dynamic steps and then everybody else kind of follows a little bit later. They should kind of make it mandatory that, they, that there will be at least one woman on the committee. No, but at, so even at least one. At least one at the beginning. So they have to have at least one. That's what it takes sometimes, unfortunately. We, we say we want more, but if there's nobody there, how many people are going to move in front? Sometimes it only takes that one. If she's there, she's comfortable, then another will come, and so on, and they'll keep coming, and they'll keep coming, and they'll know that they'll be comfortable. If there's nothing there, if there's no woman there in the first place, it's, it's very difficult sometimes, you know? So I think that if the bigger Gurdwara sometimes do take, and the bigger organisation, like this, you know, this organisation, and other Sikh organisations, if they just take that stance that they have to have a, at least one woman on there, then I think that that will make, I think that will start changing things. Okay, so I have to say that we have come to the end. Can you believe that we've been going for two hours, <laughs> right? And uh, I thank everyone for their contribution. I am going to attempt to try and bring some points in from the first topic, which was really about leadership. Uh, we spoke about the fact that sometimes maybe it's in, our, in, in the blood of women to <laughs> fight, you know, uh, and have that drive, which is, which is what we did uh, see, didn't we, uh, in the past uh, and the examples that we've given as well, including uh, Princess Sophia as well. Um, amongst many of the other examples that we gave. Sikh girls being brought up with an attitude to actually have a positive outlook and going out there and being successful, uh, a personal drive, um, not necessarily walking into a room and considering that a default situation is that the male is going to be taken seriously and the female will not. Now, I don't mean to say that they've necessarily had to have courage for that, but they have the opportunity to um, do what they need to do in their own way. Okay, and uh, there are obviously different traits, but you can um, uh, make sure that you get an, uh, ahead using whatever skills you have. And if you feel passionately about doing something, like you were saying earlier on about, you know, you, you, you know you've been educating for seven years, you've got the knowledge, you can go forward and write those books. If you feel passionate about the art, you want to fight for that. If you're in a position where you feel that you're, you, know, you can really have the support of the household, you support your husband, the husband supports you, you've got opportunities there, you strive forward, you're successful, you have an opportunity starting out and seeing what, what 
there is that EY can offer. And then Bao K, we were talking earlier on, you know, about all the inspirational work that you've done, um, and going out there and, and leading with that expertise and supporting uh, Ravi, Ravi supporting you. It's kind of a, 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 a um, it works both ways. On the second topic, we'll be talking about the role of, uh, changing role of women in terms of a Sikhi perspective. Yes, nurturing is there. Yes, we did pick up the point about whether it's the male or the female. It depends. Sometimes, you know, there's more spirituality in one than the other. But then, in theory, they can balance it out if they decide to do that. I like the points about father influence, you know, about sometimes people have got on because their fathers have felt it's very important uh, and they've supported all the way. Uh, but then again, we did touch on that very dodgy area, which is about, you know, violence and, and the ability to change how those families exist today and, and actually change for the better. Uh, and I, my point was the fact that you shouldn't stand back and just watch it happen to your next door neighbour. Maybe I'll, you know, you'll get into trouble for that, but at least you're you know, defending the defenceless. That's my personal opinion anyway. There is personal strength. I do like the idea about uh, nurturing, uh, and I think it was interesting, the point that was made about the fact that we're in shock that there aren't necessarily the shelters, or I know Seat Helpline does loads of work as well. So that's it. I'd like to thank the panellists. Sukhmuni, thanks so much. Bao K, Aisha, Paramjit, Singh Twins, thank you so much. And also, all the people behind the scenes that have come here uh, from Birmingham to record the programme, the EY Seat Network, uh, Indy and Mumpri, and of course you, they, you know, okay. this leading position, okay. and you've done lots of work in the background to do that. The camera person, Raj, who's here, loads of people I, if I haven't mentioned as well, the microphone people. Thank you so much for coming out today, all of you, and making this uh, a, an event that where you've contributed, and hopefully you, you've taken something away, uh, and it's inspired you to change, not necessarily yourself, your opportunities that you have, uh, your families, uh, as well as your neighbours. Uh, to actually look out for other people. So thanks so much indeed, and thanks to the channel. Why good you go, Why good you for the? So that that concludes our program for today. I'd like to echo uh, Dr. Savi's sentiments. Thank you to our wonderful panelists here this evening, our host Dr. Savi Singh, and all of the guests here and our viewers at home. Um, if you'd like to find out more about the EY Seek Network events, you can find us on social media at EY Seek Network, or you can also drop us an email at eyseekgroup at uk.ey.com. Thank you for everyone for attending this evening. Why Guruji ka Khalsa, Why Guruji ki Fateh. Okay, so Amritha, I'd like to ask you how you felt about the event today and what you think you took away from it. Um, the event was very good today. Um, there were some brilliant speakers about and the panel were very inspirational. Um, I think I took away from the event um, a can-do attitude. Whether it's big or small, you can make a change in your life that can help in the wider community. Women, over time, will become a, b a bigger power, and I think that will be a bigger change in the Sikh community. Good. What I was really keen to know is, I know that you have a representation at Oxford, and you've come to the event today, and your participant at the event is a male attendee. I was quite keen to know what you think you took away from the event and how you felt about it. I think um, for a lot of these for a lot of these events, it's female dominated as it should be, but clearly there are males in the Sikh community. Uh, males have a really big role to play as well. So I was especially keen to come along to find out which what role I could play in the community about advancing these issues um, and also becoming educated as well. Sort of hearing the testimonials of, of the fantastic women and the panelists was really interesting, and it's given me a lot to think about and sort of that's what I can take away as a male I think. So what made you come to this event today at EY? Um, the topic and the issues that were discussed are in relation to my MA dissertation so I thought it would help me a tiny bit it's helped so much it's helped inform um, where I want to take my narrative and it's given me loads of ideas of what to kind of issues I should discuss in that. So Saren you work at EY and you also do quite a lot of work with Seek Helpline so quite keen to know your thoughts on this evening. Um, I think the key point that I'll pick up from today's event is um, how can, in a household, um, at work, at, in a work environment, how can men help empower women at the same time? What can I do? For example, I have a sister, so what can I do to make, so, make sure that we're both as equally treated in a household? Okay, Amarjit Singh, partner at EY. 
I'm really keen to know what you thought of this evening and what you think you took from this evening too. Well, I think it's brilliant that we could actually run an event which brought together the diversity and inclusiveness strands at EVI because you know we, we push for our ethnic minorities and we push for our women and it's great to have an event where those two come together. For me personally though, there were lots of learnings which I took away. There were some brilliant stories from panel members, some really inspirational stories of what uh, uh, what these women had done, which you know, I'm definitely going to take away and use uh, uh, with my own daughter, and actually to inspire her and to you know some really good lessons as well about about making sure that we bring up our children equal and and how we ensure that actually they have proper role models. I think there were some really really interesting and good uh, ideas. Okay, Bimmy, tell me what made you come here this evening. Uh, well, I was here for Vasaki over the weekend, uh, which I thought was absolutely a phenomenal experience. My first ever time in London, um, experiencing the joys of City Hall, but also coming to the event and actually seeing the good work that the EY network were doing. I was so impressed with uh, just the amazing amount of dynamism that exists in the city in terms of what young Sikh people are actually doing and how heavily they were involved. What made you come to this particular one? Um, I just thought the whole topic was quite interesting. I think in the Sikh community we don't talk about women enough and, and the role of women and how to empower women. So I think that's one of the reasons why I came today. Excellent. And I think I took away the fact that, you know, we as women in the Sikh community need to support each other. Um, and men should also support us and you know equality is about supporting each other men and women supporting each other It's not just about women. It's not just about men. So I think that's what I took away today. Okay, Anisha Seth um, Co-lead of the EY Seek Network and you've organized the whole event this evening worked really hard to put it together um, Tell me what you think of the of the event and how you think it went and what you are hoping people took away from it um, Thank you um, well, I th hope that the event went well, to be honest, because the th questions were great. I saw a lot of in engagement and interaction from the audience, which was the main thing. At the end of the day, the point of the event was to create that awareness, get people talking about women and our, our role in society and in a Sikh community. Um, the feedback that we've had is pretty, pretty amazing. Um, I think the only real um, development point that we're getting is that people want more of these events. So that's our job done, really. People are talking, and I think the fact that they want more, people you know, can see that change in, in perception of, of women. I think that's the main thing, and we're, we're doing our job. Okay, so we're here this evening with Lovepreet Singh, Anisha Gaur, Indy Singh and Sudden Singh. So Lovepreet, really keen to talk to you first of all, a little bit about the background about the EY Seek network and how it came about. Okay, so the, the network's been a, around for just over four years now. Uh, the reason why it was created is that um, EY as, as a company promote um, diversity and inclusiveness. Um, and as such, we want to support that wider program and we wanted to create a platform for Sikhs um, who are also professionals who don't necessarily have the time um, to not always go to the, the Gurdwara, go to the Gurukar after work. So what we want to do is provide an, a, another platform for them to um, come and make Sangat within London. Um, the first couple of events that we've done were all internal, so focusing on um, ensuring that the infrastructure in the team was, was, was set up correctly. And then once we grew to a certain number, we opened up the events to external um, uh, our clients. So the first external event, uh, one of the first external events was a, a week-long Vasaki um, celebration. So on the in the beginning of the week, we had the gen uh, we had the Secretary of State Vince Cable uh, to do um, to do uh, to, he we, we invited him down to talk about the seat contribution to British economy. And then we had the day after that. We had we focused on the more spiritual side. So we had um, we had Girtan, we had Simran, and we had yoga. The third day we ended it off by talking about Sikhs in art. So and also by media. So we had the Singh twins. We had who was then the um, head of BBC Religion, Tommy Nagra, mm -hmm. to talk about Sikhs in the media. And that was the first time that was the the events were actually opened to people outside of the network. Mm -hmm. And then it's just snowballed ever since. Um, and since then, so my successor uh, was Manraj 
Singh Hoti. And um, so he, you know, he 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 took on the network, and what we we changed the we changed some of the um, the d dynamics in the group and focused more on the education piece. So we really went down to grassroots, and we we were the one of the first to actually the first to start off the Why Good course in the city. So that was a grassroots um, uh, educational program for those that uh, in the I'll say a pl 18 plus to learn something about Sikhi. Um, and then, and then, w then the network was taken over by Indi, Indi Hotti, and he focused more on the art side, and enabling more towards um, e enabling students to get into professional services firms. Thank you. So we've now got Indi and Anisha, and you co-lead the EY Seek Network together. So keen to talk to you both a little bit about that with your views. Sure. So as as Lovepreet uh, mentioned, we've done a number of events around the education space. And when I recently uh, took leadership of the EYC network over a year ago, we took had a strong focus on the arts. Sikhi has a, has a strong lineage with the arts dating back over 500 years. For example, Gavi Dabar is where there would be poetry at Harmandir Sahib and trying to bring that back in the contemporary way because we really felt in our in our community that the arts was underrepresented. So what we what we did was provide a platform here at EY to showcase the work of artists through a variety of different mediums, whether that's through film, um, orthodox arts, photography, and even poetry, uh, to provide that platform for people to appreciate their work. And we also, as Lovepreet mentioned, focused on student support. So providing students from minority backgrounds um, practical tools and advice to get into the city and we work very closely with our student recruitment team here and to help support them in terms of reaching out to a wider audience and helping individuals who want to get into the city. And I'm really excited to have uh, Anisha on board as co-lead of the EY Seek Network since uh, January 2015 who now who is now taking the Seek Network uh, with a giving the EYC network a strong focus now on sort of female themes and topics within the Sikh community. Yeah, so Anisha, you're the first lady to be leading a network like this, which is a fantastic achievement. Um, yeah, um, it's something that everybody's really excited about, to be honest. And uh, I think the way they summarise it was great. So, you know, we still are keeping very much to the strands of, you know, education, arts and graduate recruitment. But within that, we, we are tying in, um, you know, a focus on empowering Sikh women. And I think that is very important. And that is essentially what today's event was about. You know, that was the focus. It was all female panel hasn't really been done before you know and people from the different backgrounds so you know we had the education we had people from education we had people from the charity sector and we had people from the arts so everybody was there you know that we focus on but at the same time we're keeping it very much in line with our agenda wh which rolls into uh, Ian, um, EY's DNI agenda as well of you know focusing on women and trying to give the uh, see young Sikh women confidence to come forward. So focusing on diversity and inclusiveness. Excellent. So, Soren, I know that you do a lot within the marketing and the social media space. How, have the e how has the EY network been received by social media? Um, first of all, I'd just like to say that um, it wouldn't, any, none of this would be possible without the support from the public. Um, and the EY Seek Network, is we, we've received a fantastic response from all the public. Um, you can find us for any queries, or if you have any questions, you can get in touch with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, and we've had a fantastic response from the public. Um, after each event, we've received great feedback. Um, so I think it's great. It's a great platform for us to use to raise awareness of our Seek Network and all the great work that our network's doing here. Okay, so I know that this isn't the first type of event like this that the EY Seek Network have organised, and you've done some pretty big events, especially recently. Tell me a little bit more about that. Uh, so just last week we worked with the Mayor of London to deliver Vasaki celebrations for the first time at City Hall. So previously these Vasaki celebrations used to be held at Trafalgar Square and now we've got a new iconic location at City Hall and it's changed the message of Vasaki to not just focus on the cultural aspect but to also focus on the formation of the religious identity. So this is the first time th uh, this kind of event's been held to the public at City Hall and what it did feature was live Kirtan from a number of leading Kirtanis in the UK. It also had a key focus on Lungard and with the Lungard it was all organic and raw foods. So it's the first time that Lungard has been sourced 
fully from UK UK farm, local UK farms. Mm -hmm. And in addition to that, we also had a number of art exhibitions and also a, an amazing live art exhibition from Inquisitive. And then an outdoor, air, outdoor area space next to City Hall called The Scoop. We also had Bhangra, Gatka and live poetry. So it really provided a an holistic view of Vasaki. And we were the e the EYC network of the only professional services firm to be supporting the Mayor of London in coordinating and delivering this event. So we were really excited to do that. Um, it's been received extremely well and we look forward to working with them in the future. So we've seen a lot of the pictures and you know there was a lot going on with social media and there was such a buzz around the event as well. So what are you going to do now to make sure that you keep doing events like this? Like I said, it's, it's keeping to our core focus of education, art, and student support. We have a really passionate team of individuals at the EYC network, so it's not just us four that are, are here talking here today. We've got a team of 20 individuals who are really passionate, we're all very like-minded, and we always take a very open and a collaborative approach to working with each other. And so we'll continue to be doing, doing the events that we feel add value to the community and to the SEAT community and support the wider DNI initiatives at Ernst & Young. And thank you very much to all of you for having us here today. It's been a fantastic evening, so thank you. Yeah.